Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Tech Talk. Our topic will be migrating workloads to Amazon Elasticash. My name is Jim Gallagher, and I'm a specialist solutions architect here at AWS. My role here is focused on helping customers best leverage the amazing possibilities of in-memory data stores. Today's session will be primarily technical in nature, including hands-on demos and in-depth walkthroughs. We'll cover some basics of the service beforehand, so even if you're new to Elasticash, stick around. We'll have some great information for you. We'll be available in the chat to answer any questions you may have. And in addition, we'll make this presentation available online after the fact for later reference. I've included my email address and Twitter handle, so please feel free to reach out with any questions. We'll also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And with that, let's dive in. To get the notes out of this talk, it's helpful to have an idea of what Elasticash is and what problems it solves. So we'll start with a brief overview of the service and the open source engines it supports. Next, we'll look at some common reasons customers choose to move their managed or self-managed workloads into Elasticash. Then we'll dive into the actual nuts and bolts of performing the migration, some operational best practices to consider, and give some real world demos. The first approach we'll show is the backup and restore method, where we take a snapshot of our current system and import that into our new Elasticache environment. The second approach will be to use a feature of Elasticache called the Online Migration Tool. This allows customers to perform a real-time synchronization of their legacy environments into Elasticache. We'll follow up with some customer examples. You'll help firsthand the benefits Elasticache deliver to their business compared to self-hosting. Lastly, we'll go over a few helpful tips and tricks to help ensure a smooth migration and provide some links to follow-up materials, such as hands-on labs, documentation, and other ways to learn. So let's start with a brief overview of what Elasticash is. We'll cover the basics of the service, common use cases, how Elasticash fits in with additional AWS services, and practical considerations about migrating workloads to Elasticash. We hear from customers constantly about the needs for speed in their applications. Can you think of an application that couldn't benefit from going faster? Speed matters in business too. An independent study by Akamai found that a delay of only 100 milliseconds can hurt potential e-commerce conversion rates by up to 7%. Customers today expect as close to real-time performance as possible. Being fast is one thing, but scale matters too. When developing modern internet applications, you need the ability to handle the internet scale that comes with it. That elasticity is a key driver for moving workloads to the cloud. Applications of all types can benefit from the ability to serve their users in as close to real time as possible. From e-commerce to gaming, media, financial services, we all expect the ability to fire up our devices and get what we need as soon as possible. Similarly, developers expect the ability to work with open source technologies and common APIs without getting locked into expensive commercial grade databases. And of course, AWS customers expect flexible pay-as-you-go pricing to allow them to start small and grow over time. And all of this should be available across the globe in all the regions that AWS supports. This is where Elasticache comes into play. AWS offers a wide variety of purpose-built databases depending on your application needs, from relational models to serverless key value, document, graph, and other NoSQL databases, and even managed blockchains. Elasticache is unique in this family in that all data is always served directly from memory. Traditionally, the database has been the slowest link in the application stack, but with in-memory databases, your data is available at the speed of RAM. If we think back to the last slide, where we require the ability for our applications to respond in near real time, leveraging the fastest possible database becomes critical. One of the great things about Elasticache is that it can work in conjunction with these other offerings from the AWS purpose-built family, either as a cache for hot data along with other backend data stores or as a standalone memory tier amongst many data stores in a modern microservice-driven application stack. With AWS, we give you the flexibility to choose the right tool for the job. And when it comes to the utmost in performance, Elasticache is that tool. We'll look at some example architectures with these patterns shortly. Let's take a deeper look at the service. The first note is that Elasticache supports two popular open source in-memory engines, Memcached and Redis. The primary focus on today's talk will be around Redis, 
This is because as an open source technology, it has greater capabilities for migrating data. Memcached is typically used for entirely ephemeral workloads. It doesn't support things like replication or persistence. That being said, Memcached workloads can benefit tremendously from migrating to Elastic Cache, but these are typically simpler migrations due to the largely ephemeral nature of the data stored in the engine. More on this later. We've noticed a significant trend of customers adopting Redis. We'll cover it extensively in the rest of this presentation, but just know that Elastic Cache is compatible with open source Redis and Memcached. If you have these workloads already running, self-hosted, you can migrate them typically without any code changes. Of course, customers choose ElastiCache primarily for the extreme performance as discussed in the previous slides. Typical performance for ElastiCache queries is measured not in milliseconds, but actual microseconds. Beyond the benefits of just being an open source in-memory data store, ElastiCache as a service offers a tremendous amount of benefits compared to self-hosting. The first is built-in security and reliability of being a managed service. ElastiCache manages the deployment, patches, maintenance, upgrades, as well as providing network isolation, encryption options, built-in monitoring, and more. Additionally, ElastiCache can be configured to be automatically deployed across multiple availability zones with automatic failover. And lastly, ElastiCache has the capability to easily scale your workload at the push of a button, from the smallest dev environment to clusters with hundreds of nodes across multiple regions. In short, ElastiCache greatly simplifies the deployment, management, and scalability of your in-memory database environments with the open source APIs that developers love. In fact, for the fourth year in a row, Redis has won Stack Overflow's most loved database award in their annual developer survey. Our customers too tell us they love Redis for its speed, ease of use, and rich feature set of built-in data structures. Typical use cases for Redis are caching, messaging, real-time analytics, leaderboards, and much more. Many consider Redis to be a Swiss army knife of sorts for this flexibility. And later on, we'll see how these different approaches affect our potential migration strategy. A bit more about Redis. As mentioned, developers love it for its built-in data structures. However, beyond the data structures, it has a number of excellent features that assist in migrating data, the ability to replicate data across nodes, and built-in persistence through snapshots. We'll see these features in action throughout our presentation today. Memcached, while conceptually similar to Redis as an in-memory data store, is much simpler in practice. It supports one data structure, the string, and doesn't include any of the persistence and replication options of Redis. As such, when it comes to migrating to ElastiCache, as mentioned, it's usually a very simple matter of pointing your application to the new environment without having to worry about migrating any data. Customers love Memcached for its simplicity and high performance. And being compatible with open source Memcached makes migrating to ElastiCache easy for your Memcached workload. With these two engines, here's a small sample of some of the common use cases for ElastiCache. As mentioned, any application that has a need for any sort of real-time performance can benefit from an in-memory layer. Caching is by far the most common use case, typically in conjunction with other slower data stores. Similarly, real-time analytics dashboards can be powered with ElastiCache due to those sub-millisecond response times. If you've recently played an online game that had a leaderboard of some sort, chances are that was powered by ElastiCache. Similarly, if you've used a ride-hailing app or a dating app that required real-time geospatial information, it's also likely that ElastiCache was powering that information. Similarly, distributed session stores, real-time chats, distributed queues, machine learning feature stores, and much more are all fantastic examples of way to leverage ElastiCache. Let's spend a few moments looking at some example architectures, one for caching and one for a session store. Our first example architecture we'll look at is in a database caching pattern. Here we are showing one of many approaches, the write-through or lazy loading approach. This is a very simple, well-known pattern that typically involves just a few lines of code to dramatically improve your application performance. Here we are using ElastiCache in conjunction with another backend data store, such as RDS. The first step an application does when looking for data is to check the cache first. If it's there, also known as a cache hit, the data is returned to the application, once again, typically in some millisecond time, and the application never has to query the database. If the data is not in the cache, also known as a cache miss, the application then queries from the database for the requested data. 
At the same time, we then populate the cache with this data for future queries. Typically, customers set a TTL on this cache data to help ensure cache freshness. Another architecture for ElastiCache is here as a session store. In this example, ElastiCache is operating entirely standalone from other data stores. This is a very powerful pattern as it unlocks the ability to have elasticity in your application layer. Rather than relying on something like sticky sessions or an endnote cache, all session information for a user of an application resides in ElastiCache. This can be login information, browsing history, shopping cart data, et cetera. We entirely remove the concept of storing stateful information from the application layer. This diagram shows EC2 instances, but these could also be containers or Lambda functions, any type of compute. Now that we understand a little bit more about the service, let's take a look at some of the reasons our customers have told us they chose to migrate their self-hosted workloads into ElastiCache. The first reason customers look to a managed service for their Memcached and Redis workloads is that while these open source engines are very easy to get started with and use as a developer, you'll notice that it's the developers who love the database, not the operations teams. Our customers tell us they don't want the undifferentiated heavy lifting of managing the underlying servers, software versions, monitoring, configuration, backups, etc. They just want the performance and scale without the operational overhead. Beyond the basics of the infrastructure, these open source technologies are challenging to make highly available. The ability to detect and automatically recover from failures requires complex custom development and management. And beyond just the availability aspect, scaling becomes cumbersome as well. You need to monitor your systems to know when to scale in the first place, and then actually performing the scaling operations themselves can be error prone. All of this results in additional expense in the form of people's time, operational processes, and unnecessary complexity. The benefits of leveraging a managed service include removing this operational overhead, allowing your teams to focus on business differentiators and innovating faster, and ultimately serving your customers. Not only does ElastiCache remove the operational burden of managing your Redis workloads, there are a number of enhancements it provides over typical self-hosted open source Redis. Here are a few examples of some recent enhancements we've made to the service. The first is Global Data Store. It allows customers the ability to replicate their environments across regions, providing low latency read access wherever your customers may be. The next is the ability to scale your Redis clusters dynamically with online resharding, providing zero downtime, four-way scalability, in and out, as well as up and down. Here we can scale our environments up to 500 nodes total, and each node can have over 600 gigabytes total data storage. We've also recently added support for the latest AWS Nitro system, which greatly enhances network performance. We've also made enhancements to the IO capabilities of the Redis engine itself to deliver increased network performance. And not shown here too is support for the latest Graviton2 family of instances, which can provide up to 40% price to performance improvement. All of these features are not available in open source Redis, making them additional drivers for adoption of ElastiCache. Now let's take a look at some factors you want to consider when planning your migration to ElastiCache. Assuming you already have self-hosted Memcached or Redis workload identified that you'd want to move to ElastiCache, you'll first want to classify some details. Is this workload ephemeral or is it more persistent? For example, if you're doing a simple database cache with a lazy, lazy, lazy loading pattern as shown earlier, you may be fine with simply pointing your application at a new ElastiCache endpoint without migrating any of the data. However, if your workload is more of a primary database or session store, you may want to consider more of a zero downtime strategy. Based upon the characteristics of your workload and business needs, you can plan an appropriate migration strategy. Another strategic decision you'll make is whether to do an online or offline migration. This goes back to the previous point of knowing how much downtime your application can tolerate from the in-memory layer of your architecture. Do you have the ability to schedule a maintenance window? Then perhaps an offline strategy will work best. Do you require minimal downtime, perhaps with a fully hydrated cache? Then maybe an online approach would be more appropriate. You'll also want to consider the behavior of your application when cutting over to the new environment. For most applications, it's simply a matter of switching the endpoint. 
but you want to have an operational plan for how you'll enact that configuration change in your environment and understand the details of how and when to cut over. This is dependent on your application architecture and outside the scope of this talk, but we encourage you to reach out and see if we can help. You'll also want to plan your destination Elastic Cache environment appropriately. Here next, we'll discuss some guidelines that can help determine the appropriate cluster size and topology for the workload's performance characteristics. So digging deeper into the available Redis deployment topologies, uh, this is a critical aspect to consider because it, it will affect which migration options are available to you, as well as the future scalability of your workload. There are two possible deployment options for Elastic Cache for Redis, cluster mode enabled or disabled. Here, cluster mode refers to the ability of Redis to shard the data set across multiple nodes that act in concert as one logical cluster. Each shard or partition can have up to five replicas. Similarly, in cluster mode disabled, your entire data set will reside on one node, but can also scale to include up to five replicas as well. We won't cover the entirety of the differences between the two. And we'll also include some references later on about how to size your workload. However, I would like to note that typically customers choose cluster mode enabled for larger data sets and or higher, higher performance workloads as it can scale to over 300 terabytes of total in-memory storage and handle well over tens of millions of operations per second. However, when we start looking at migration paths from a tooling perspective, there are different approaches that we'll showcase next depending on the cluster topology. If you notice in the migration path section of the comparison, that cluster mode enabled supports the backup and restore method and cluster mode disabled has the ability to use the online migration tool. Let's take a look at these approaches now. Here's our first migration approach, the backup and restore method. Conceptually, this pattern is very simple. We'll leverage the built-in capabilities of Redis to create a snapshot of our data on disk, referred to as an RDB file. An RDB is a binary representation of the data stored in memory with some compression. Once we have the snapshot in place, it's simply a matter of uploading the snapshot to an S3 bucket and granting ElastiCache read access to the RDB file. Then when we grant, then when we create our new ElastiCache cluster, we specify the RDB file and use it to seed the data for the new cluster. Since this is what is considered an offline migration, we recommend this approach whenever you can leverage a planned maintenance window. The overall time to restore will depend on how large your RDB file is, as well as the overall cluster size. So we encourage you to test this out ahead of time whenever possible. Let's see this process in action. We'll start with a locally running Redis server on my laptop, generate some sample data to save the RDB file, and then we'll copy it to an S3 bucket, grant the permissions, and create the new cluster with the RDB file. So here we are on my local laptop. The first thing I will do is fire up an instance of the Redis server itself. This I have pre-installed, compiled from source, and this is simply an example of open source Redis. Now that the server is up and running, I can connect to it with the Redis CLI utility. So here now I'm connected to the server. I can first perform a simple uh, keys command just to see what's on here. We can see that we have currently no data in our system. So I'll do just some simple commands to uh, save some data in here. So I'll do set hello world get hello. So we can see now that we have a very simple test key uh, saved in our system. The next step will be to generate the RDB file. Here I'll leverage the built-in Redis command called save, and that's it. Uh, we'll also notice uh, an entry here from the server process itself saying that it saved the database file to disk. With that, I'll go ahead and uh, disconnect from my server. And I'll look for this file that's by default called dump.rdb and see if it's there. And here it is. So the next step will be to copy this file into an S3 bucket. I've already went ahead and created an S3 bucket at a, ahead of time with the default settings. The next step will just be to copy it. And I'll do this from the command line because I'm a command line guy. But in general, you could do this through the console or through an API. Uh, whichever approach uh, you feel most comfortable with. So with that, I'll leverage the uh, AWS CLI and use the S3 command and the copy sub command. So I'll pass it in the location of my RDB file. And then I'll 
specify the location of the S3 bucket I've created. And with that, my file is now uploaded. So I will switch over now to my browser and we'll take a look. Here's my S3 bucket. I'll click refresh here and we should see my file that I've recently uploaded. So the next step now is to grant the appropriate permissions to allow ElastiCache to read this file. So first, I simply click on the file itself, and then I click on the Permissions tab. And next, I click on the Edit button. The next step here is to scroll down and go to the section that says Access for Other AWS Accounts, and click the Add Grantee button. The simplest method here is to refer to the ElastiCache documentation, which I have pulled up, which will give the canonical ID required for typical uh, ElastiCache access to your bucket. If there's a different region you're running in or some other uh, reason why the defaults won't work, the options are laid out here very clearly in the documentation. So we encourage you to, to have a look. But with that, I'll copy the canonical ID, go back to the console, paste the canonical ID here and grant the appropriate read permissions here and scroll down and click Save Changes. So now my backup file has the appropriate permissions for ElastiCache uh, to allow it to be uh, seeded into a new cluster. So next, we'll switch over to my other tab here where I'm now I'm at the ElastiCache dashboard in the AWS console. You can navigate here simply by scrolling down to the database section and clicking on ElastiCache. Next, I'll click the Create button under Create Cluster. In here, I'll leave most of the, the defaults because we're not doing anything uh, too crazy here, but I'll just give it a name called Seeded from Backup. And then, as I mentioned, I'll just leave most of the defaults on here. These have all been pre-configured to be available, but the critical aspect of this section here called Import Data to Cluster. So here's where I will specify the location of the RDB file in my S3 bucket. So I'll specify my alias, followed by the location of the file. And with that, it's just simply a matter of clicking Create. Once again, I could have done this through the command line or through the API, but for simplicity's sake, I'm just doing it through the console. So with that, ElastiCache is initiating the process to create the new cluster and import the backup. This process will take a few minutes, so we'll come back and check in on it as we investigate our other approach, leveraging the online migration. Let's take a look at our next approach, leveraging the online migration tool for ElastiCache. Whereas the previous example was an offline approach, the online migration tool lets you perform a live replication and cut over to ElastiCache while keeping your data sets in sync. The process here is to spin up a target ElastiCache environment first, and then point your existing self-hosted Redis environment uh, to this new cluster. This process has a few prerequisites to allow the systems to successfully communicate. So let's take a look at those now. To prepare your source and target Redis nodes for migration, identify the target ElastiCache deployment and make sure that you can migrate data to it. An existing or newly created ElastiCache deployment should meet the following requirements for migration. It's cluster mode disabled using Redis Engine version 5.05 or higher. It doesn't have either encryption in transit or encryption at rest enabled. It has multi-AZ with auto failover enabled. It has sufficient memory to fit the data from your Redis on EC2 instance. You can migrate directly from Redis versions 2.8.21 onward to Redis versions 5.0.5 onward. Make sure that the configuration of your Redis on EC2 and the ElastiCache for Redis deployment are compatible. At a minimum, all the following in the target ElastiCache deployment should be compatible with the Redis configuration for Redis replication. Your Redis cluster should be in cluster mode disabled configuration. Your Redis on EC2 instance should not have Redis auth enabled. Redis config protected mode should be set to no. If you have bind configuration in your Redis config, then it should be updated to allow requests from ElastiCache nodes. The number of logical databases should be the same on the ElastiCache node as your Redis on EC2 instance. This value is set using databases in the Redis config. 
Redis commands that perform data modification should not be renamed to allow replication of the data to succeed. To replicate the data from your Redis cluster to Elasticache, make sure that there is sufficient CPU and memory to handle this additional load. This load comes from an RDB file created by your Redis cluster and transferred over the network to Elasticache node. Make sure that your EC2 instance can connect with Elasticache by doing the following. Ensure that your EC2 instance IP address is private. Assign or create the Elasticache deployment in the same VPC as your Redis on EC2 instance. If the VPCs are different, set up VPC peering to allow access between the nodes. The security group attached to your Redis on EC2 instance should allow inbound traffic from Elasticache nodes. Make sure that your application can direct traffic to Elasticache nodes after migration of data is complete. With that, let's take a look at an example of the online migration tool. Similar to our last example, we'll have a small test environment running on an EC2 server that I've pre-configured based upon the requirements listed previously. We'll then initiate a migration from the console, watch the results in real time, and then code over. We'll show a very simple example here today, but longer examples with greater amounts of data can be monitored uh, via CloudWatch as the migration proceeds. So here I am connected to my additional server running on EC2. Just like last time, the first thing I'll do is fire up a locally running copy of the Redis server that I've compiled from source. Like last time, we get some boilerplate information about the, the server itself, but it's running in the background, and we can connect to it from the command line. As before, first, we'll clean out all of the memory or all of the keys that may be on the system, and we'll set some more uh, test keys. So we'll do this um, things like set Okay, I'll key call online with a value to migration. We'll maybe do some extras like create a, a set called teams and add uh, some NFL teams in there like Bears, Lions, Packers. And maybe we'll also create a, a hash. We'll do something like employees and do Jeff Bezos and Andy Jassy. One of the requirements was to set a parameter of the configuration called config set protected mode. No. Protected mode is a safeguard feature of Redis, where if you spin up a, a cluster with the defaults, like I'm doing here, uh, by default, it won't allow any connections from external services. But since we are migrating uh, to an external service, uh, we need to uh, have this uh, configura configuration uh, set to no for now. So with that, our system should be ready uh, to be uh, migrated from to our new Elasticache environment. Here, once again, I'm back in the Elasticache panel. And here is a cluster that I've pre-created matching the prerequisites uh, from before. I'm in cluster mode disabled. I have two nodes with multi-AZ uh, failover with no um, encryption and transit enabled. So the first step is to come in here and click the Actions button and click Migrate Data from Endpoint. Pardon me, I may need to refresh my screen. I'll click Migrate Data from Endpoint. Here, the only parameter I need to pass in is the source Redis endpoint. This should be the private IP address of the server running in EC2 with your existing Redis server. I happen to have this IP address handy, so I'll put it in now. And with that, all I have to do is click Start Migration. What this will do behind the scenes is initiate the migration process. We should see some information from the Redis server running on EC2 about Elasticache connecting in and starting the replication process. Let's see what pops up. And here we see, it, it may be a little challenging to see, but this is the information from the server uh, replicating out. I will highlight here that it's attempting to do a partial uh, resynchronization first, but that fails uh, because it hasn't synced before. And then it creates a new replication and spits out some information that's pretty uh, detailed and technical, but this is simply what Redis outputs to indicate where it is in the migration process. If we notice here, eventually we get a output from the server that says it's synchronizing with a replica. And this is the IP address of our new Elasticache cluster. And it says it's succeeded. 
So with that, we can go back to our console. And now that our replication has finished, we can come back in, click the Actions menu again, and click Stop Data Migration. Once again, we can go back to our terminal, and we should see some information saying that the uh, system has uh, disconnected. We should now also be able to connect to our new Elastic Cache server and see the data that we've replicated over. So with that, here I am now connected uh, to Elastic Cache uh, from the command line. And ideally, if I do key star, I should see my data. And here are the keys that I created earlier. So I could do a get online or h get all employees. So here's the data that I generated locally on the system now residing on the last cache. Our online migration has uh, successfully completed. And with that, I can clean up my existing EC2 server, and now I'm free to use ElastiCache. For the final part of our presentation, let's look at some example customer stories and review some follow-up materials. Here we have a few example customer experiences migrating to ElastiCache. The first is the dating app Tinder who recently published an article in Forbes detailing their experiences migrating to ElastiCache. A few quotes from the article. Before our migration to ElastiCache, the failover of a Redis cache node was the largest single source of app downtime at Tinder. After migrating, the frequency of node reliability issues plummeted, and we experienced a marked increase in app stability. It became as easy as clicking a few buttons in the AWS Management Console to scale our clusters, create new shards, and add nodes. The Redis migration feed up our operations engineers' time and resources to a great extent and brought about dramatic improvements in monitoring and automation. Similarly, in 2018, Airbnb migrated to ElastiCache from self-hosted Redis. Julie Trias, a site reliability engineer at the time, detailed their experiences in a reInvent talk. You can find her session on YouTube, and we've linked it here as well. It provides a great in-depth example of a, of a real-world use case and operational plans for migrating an internet scale application to ElastiCache. The last example we've linked is from the Pokemon Company International, makers of the acclaimed Pokemon franchise. Their infrastructure had to grow to meet the demands of up to 300 million players of their popular Pokemon Go game. Prior to migrating to ElastiCache, they faced similar downtime challenges when migrating open source cache nodes. This migration was part of a larger move to manage undertaking of the Pokemon Company International. And here we've linked to the case study they published with AWS. Lastly here, we'd like to provide uh, a few links and tips about additional resources when it comes to planning and operating your ElastiCache migration. The first is on our website, you can find a plethora of information similar to what we've shown today in terms of how-to guides, as well as hands-on labs. I've also included a link to an excellent blog post we recently published that outlines best practices when it comes to sizing your ElastiCache environments. Given the enhancements we've made to Redis and ElastiCache, we find that customers can dramatically save money on their in-memory workloads by right-sizing their environments and taking advantage of the elasticity of the service. I've also included some links to the relevant sections of the documentation for both the backup and restore method, as well as the online migration tool shown today. This was my primary reference material when creating this presentation, so I highly encourage you to review the material when performing your own migrations. I've also included some handy links to the customer reference materials shown on the last slide. Here you can find the Tinder Forbes article, the Airbnb reInvent session, and the Pokemon Company case study, as well as other first-hand customer experiences with ElastiCache. Lastly, I wanted to call out that we've heard some really positive experiences from our customers leveraging some additional open source tooling around their migrations. Since ElastiCache is compatible with open source Memcached and Redis, customers can leverage other open source tools to assist in their migration. Such tools are outside of the scope of this presentation, but if you have any questions on this front, I encourage you to reach out. And with that, I want to extend my sincerest thanks for your time today. Please feel free to contact me with any questions you may have regarding ElastiCache, Memcached, Redis, and migrating to the service. We look forward to working with you. Thanks. <laughs>